Oops. Hooks. It started. Yeah, it started. started. Yeah, it started. It started. <laughs> uh, actually, we've been already starting <laughs> the conversation. Okay. Hmm. Welcome, everybody, to most probably the most important session we're going to be having. So I'm thrilled and delighted to have you um, all in the audience. We're going to be talking about the future post-COVID, and um, we're going to do that um, in a framework, i.e. working with scenarios. Um, mm -hmm. With me is um, Irina Vesilova, Jim Yuan, and Toshihiro Toyoshima. And um, um, let me quickly use a bit of time to frame the topic mm -hmm. and introduce our panel and then excite you about um, reflecting on these, on these issues. Um, so what we have here is two challenges, namely we want to um, look into the future and as you all know, looking into the future is not the simplest thing to do. Um, um, scenarios help doing that, but, but boy, it's hard. Um, and the second thing we're dealing with, as we're dealing with, with, is with COVID, is um, we're dealing with events that have low probabilities, but have high impacts. We often refer to these as black swans um, mm -hmm. from, from referring back to the book by, by Nas, Nassim um, Nicholas Taleb from 2008. And um, um, where, where, where he looked at this, these low probability but high impact events. So we have two challenges here. We want to look into the future. We want to learn from the black swan that we've been confronted with and we want to see how to prepare for future events like this. Um, my, when, when preparing for the panel, um, I, was, I was thinking back of a trip I'd once taken from, from Boston to Europe. Um, I, was, I was jumping on a plane, um, sitting down, sitting next to, to um, a researcher from MIT and um, she she was on her way to Athens to 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 do an earthquake study and and yeah. I was I I hadn't really known that Greece was a place that was that was where earthquakes were a big problem Have, having grown up in California or so I thought mm -hmm. like, well um, um, that's where you would want to go but anyway so she was doing that and she was relating on these. Um, um, low probability but high impact um, events that we as humans have a really, really, really hard time to wrap our heads around. And so that's really what we want to do today is we want to, we want to um, wrap our head around COVID, but not just as COVID, but as a high, um, low probability, high impact event, and then figure out what that means for the future. And slowly, as the audience is coming in, um, let me introduce you to our distinguished panelists. Um, and here on on my 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 left, you see Irina Veselova. She is an, an experienced investment banker and the president of Planet Capital. Um, she's been working as a partner in several startup businesses, helping them grow and um, control their costs. She has an MBA from the Stockholm School of Economics and um, is a certified advisor on, on NASDAQ um, and OMX, the, the, um, the biggest world exchange. Then on the right, on my right, I have um, Toshi, um, Tosh, Toshihiro to, Toyoshima. Um, he's the CEO of Mercuria Investment, a private equity and alternative investment management company that's listed on the Tokyo Stock Exchange. Um, with roughly two billion um, under management, um, Mercuria has been focusing on gross cross-border growth um, in the East Asian economic um, zone and um, has subsidiaries in Hong Kong and in Bangkok. He's been founding member, um, or he's of, of Mercuria in 2005, and was appointed CEO in 
2008. Bef before that, he was he had he had been working in the public sector, i.e., in the in the World Bank, um, where as a senior specialist, he was in charge of private sector development for four African countries. So, so we have quite a scope mm. of different perspectives here. And then to just just next to him is Shim Yuan. He is he brings in the the at least for today he brings in the not for profit perspective. Um, he's a partner at Joyfu Education, um, an education consulting and project le based learning company that helps students develop into becoming more compassionate global citizens. Um, Jim self is a self described digital nomad. Uh, he's an Estonian e-resident. For those of you who are in the IT sector, know what that means. Um, he loves history and is a lifelong learner. So what we truly have here is a heterogeneous, amazing panel. And I'm thrilled and excited about starting the conversation. Um, so we'll structure today's debate into three, three questions, um, namely looking back at at COVID and comparing it with other low probability, high impact events. What have you learned? We'll then move on to um, the question, how, how do we look into the future and how, what scenarios do we imagine in the future? And then we'll become very practical at the end. I will, will give short, crisp, spiffy, um, um, advice to governments and society um, at the end. So welcome to the panel. Um, comment on the comment board, um, raise your hand. It's it's amazing to see you in, in this meeting. Um, let us start with you, Irina, looking back at COVID and comparing it with other historical scenarios, i.e. like the one that comes to my mind is a 2003 bird flu crisis. What was similar? What was different? What could have been foreseen? What could we have not known? Take a stab at this. It's a big question. Choose what you want to talk about, and then then and and then hand over to your colleagues. I know we'll get great answers out of this, Irina. The floor is yours. Thank you, Philip. Uh, I can say that uh, throughout the human history, we faced with pandemics at least uh, two, three times uh, each hundred years. So mankind has some experience how to deal with it. Uh, there are common measures which was uh, developed. The first one and the most ancient one is uh, travel restrictions which uh, we could see from Roman times, actually, when uh, uh, the time of dissemination of so-called Justinian plague in 541-542, uh, when uh, from 30 to 50 million uh, people will die. Uh, the second measure is quarantine. It's uh, quarantine for the travelers and goods and it has been implemented in Venice in uh, the 14th century. And since then we use it. Uh, quarantine, it's uh, in uh, Italian, Caranta giorni, 40 days. Uh, so we have the root of this word and we use it successfully since then. The third one, the third measure is vaccination. It's well known. And uh, this measure was implemented first in, uh, in the end of 18th century, uh, when was the pandemic of smallpox. It's, it's a disease um, when a sick person had a pockmarked face. And uh, that was uh, the first vaccine took, took its root from 1796 from England when a boy was uh, vaccinated with the cow virus. And cow in Latin means vaca. So vaccination uh, came from, from that word. 
Uh, I would say that uh, this pandemic has definitely its own peculiarities. And uh, to my opinion is uh, the speed of dissemination, global coverage, and uh, but at the same time, uh, it was relatively quick response. So vaccination was started already six months after after the beginning of pandemics. Uh, it wasn't foreseen uh, the above mentioned speed of dissemination, the amount of people infected simultaneously and um, it's definitely the medical infrastructure was not neither exist in the required uh, quantities nor equipped appropriately. Uh, at the same time, I would say that uh, Chinese speedy response uh, might be applied because in this case, it's a competition for speed. The sooner you act, the better. So this, this is uh, my quick view. Uh, Thank you. On the topic. Thank you very much. And what comes 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 to mind is I was talking to um, Dr. Tedros, the head of the WHO at the Munich Security Conference last February, and very much what what was resonating in that conversation was this 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 he was saying like oh my God the Chinese gave us one month now because they reacted so fast um, let's see what the world can do with that one month. And it was February 2020, and obviously, um, as, as the world, we didn't do that much. Um, Toshi, I'm handing over to you. Um, what's your what's your play on this? Uh, okay, uh, if there was uh, there were no uh, COVID-19 pandemic uh, last year, we had the Tokyo Olympic Games, and I'm still hopeful we can host the Tokyo Olympic Games this year. <laughs> Uh, well, uh, Irina mentioned about the historic context of the, the, uh, uh, the pandemic. Um, uh, but, uh, one thing, uh, I would like to highlight, which is already, uh, uh, incorporated in Irina's comment, but, um, uh, the world is now very much connected. As she mentioned about the restriction on travel, uh, but, uh, in the past, uh, people did not travel much. Uh, traveling to Asia was like the adventure, uh, Captain Cook. But, uh, uh, nowadays, uh, everywhere is so well connected and, and so intertwined. So uh, maybe that's related to the speed of the spreading of the disease. But also, um, it really tests how the global uh, global countries, uh, which was hit by the pandemic simultaneously, uh, react to these issues. Uh, this is like the Olympic game uh, uh where all the, the sovereign states uh, bet their own pride to compete against uh, which system works better. Like in soccer, there's the Italian soccer, German soccer, or, or, or Brazilian soccer. So like that, uh, for the, the pandemic game, uh, COVID-19 game, there's a Chinese style, uh, Taiwan style, US style, or the Japanese style. Uh, Japanese, or uh, maybe we are like far behind, so uh, it's not a good one uh, in the B league. But uh, I, I, I think maybe there's a top league uh, how to fight uh, this kind of uh, unknown crisis. Uh, another point maybe I would like to talk about a little bit about later is that uh, sometimes uh, external shock uh, can bring people together to unite the people. Uh, we see a very good uh, uh, example. Uh, in the movie named uh, Independence Day. <laughs> Independence Day, uh, do you know Independence Day? Any audience know that? Uh, it is a movie back in 1987. Uh, 1987 or something, uh, the, 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 the world was hit by the alien. So alien is destroying everywhere over the world. And the U.S. president did the coalition of all the uh, countries in different regime and, and, and ride on the fighter plane and destroy the, the, the mothership of the alien. So the world was united. Uh, well, uh, and, and actually there's a, another... Um, <clears throat> story of that, but uh, uh, the, the version in 2016 or 17 was different. And, and and the pandemic, how to cope with the pandemic in 2021 is even more totally different. World is not united. Okay, that's my quote. 
<laughs> interesting, interesting challenges there. And, and, and I think that's something we'll have to debate is like, has the pandemic united the world or not? Um, and then these different, this, what you call the Olympic games of the pandemic, um, not sure if that's really quotable, but but um, <laughs> but, uh, but, but, but <laughs> I was just talking to a colleague from Australia earlier this morning, and Australia, for example, has a very strict policy of like closing off the 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 island at the moment, and and we were we really need to work together on a project, and but she said like there's no chance for her to to leave Australia for the next 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 several months or so, um, so. So again, interesting things in, in what Toshi referred to as like different styles, different national styles of, of how, how to do that. Um, Jim, to you for your, in, your first, first idea, and then let's see what we, what we can construct out of this conversation. And, and thank you, Toshi, for also relating immediately to Irina. I think, I think we have a good conversation going on here. And like, Jim, to you. Thanks, Philip. Uh, just to build on the discussion from Toshi and from Marina as well, I was in Beijing uh, January 2020, and things were really like people were not really aware of what's going what's going on, and then suddenly, just bam, it just hit, and things were moving very very quickly. And um, I think to answer your question, Philip, and to build on the earlier discussion from uh, Toshi and Marina, one thing that was arguably different uh, with this pandemic is how politicized it has been um, in terms of all corners and all around. And, and I don't want to get into a political discussion per se, um, but, but it, it, it uh, has uh, to a large extent um, been a little bit um, uh, heartbreaking in a way in that mm -hmm. the one thing that arguably um, should have been uniting an opportunity uh, to unite Hopi Paul Sapiens has to um, arguably, to some extent, turned into uh, tragedy, neglect, politics, divisions, and racism. And um, it also has also exposed vast inequalities that exist potentially between societies, between groups within societies, mm. as well as uh, nation states themselves, between developed ones and developing ones. And, you know, as Toshi mentioned, there was a, uh, you've, you've made the, this very interesting allusion towards. Um, Olympics and in terms of the vaccine rollouts, um, as an example, there has been that um, almost like a, a race between the haves and have nots. Mm -hmm. And even between the haves, a race between the, those who have the vaccines in terms of uh, that diplomacy slash um, hoarding of vaccines, arguably. Again, I, I don't want to get into political discussion. It's been, um, you know, uh, all over social media, the, whether you're pro or con one side or another, but the um, I think, but arguably one thing um, that hasn't arguably been more is this united effort by homo sapiens from if we take a very cosmic perspective mm. uh, out of the whole uh, national communal societal uh, ranges but zoom out uh, mm. on the cosmic scale this is to some extent a, uh, a battle between homo sapiens versus nature and mm. the fact that homo sapien species have not been very uh, uh, united and if, if this were a uh, Toshi brought up a great uh, example about Independence Day. If this were the aliens from Independence Day looking at Earth, <laughs> um, this would be a very negative example of the the Homo sapiens who dominated planet Earth in terms of how they respond mm -hmm. to a major black swan event and how um, Homo sapiens are not able to be uh, united against uh, uh, forces of uh, of nature and and. Uh, in, in, in that regard, uh, but but that said, I think um, you know to to everyone's point, there is a silver lining in terms of how, um, despite the divisions within the Homo sapien species, um, Homo sapiens have been very um, genuinely very industrious in terms of coming up with solutions very rapidly in terms of uh, vaccines and other technologies that can allow itself to uh, in phases overcome this 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 uh, this this great challenge in a way. Well, now that I'd, I'd really like to go into this and maybe maybe um, prepare like short spiffy statements for to wrap up this first part because we're we're over time on the first part already. But but so what I'm hearing from you, um, I'm hearing from Irina that we really have classical responses to that, and we've had these classical responses for a long, long time. 
And so it's really, it's travel restrictions, quarantine and vaccination, boom. And, um, and what I'm hearing from everyone else is that, wow, this is a global thing and that really affects us as homo sapiens or as, as independence say, which of course um, 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 is, is a very graphic way of, 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 of describing that. But then, boy, I, I, as all of you have seen, I've seen like how we've been struggling to get this done. I mean, like Germany, for example, is a place where one of the vaccines was developed, but then we were not able to produce it. And mm -hmm. so then we got it later. But then now we are fine. But like, I mean, do we really care about the rest of the planet at the moment? No, we don't. And, and so there's all these, all these struggles that, that, that are maybe, maybe the human struggles that, that we have to deal with. So anyone who wants to jump in for a last concluding thought on, on that part, or should we move on to the next? No, let's move on to the next. <laughs> yeah, we, yeah, I think the part, you concluded part in very good. Uh, we can yeah, you made an excellent summary, and, uh, uh, and, and that's a kind of overreaching agenda. Okay, so then next question, and I'll move the other way around this time. Jim, so you'll be first. Um, abstracting from your COVID experience and learning um, and, and what you've learned, what are future scenarios you see? as we come out of the pandemic? What's, what will the world be like in 2030? So that's, a, uh, that's a great question. I'll, I'll try to um, uh, do this quite succinctly. Um, I think one scenario uh, potentially from a, um, so, uh, um, from a market consumer perspective, uh, I, I was in the discussion earlier during one of the networking sessions with uh, Aditya, uh, one of the speakers, and we, we talked about how um, could this potentially lead to a, uh, a roaring 20s? There was a, I think there was a harassment panel uh, during a previous meeting about the idea. It was hosted by uh, Mr. Uh, Benjamin Butler, a futurist, about the hustle idea of roaring 20s. So we, in terms of um, both technology and business, arguably the pandemic has sped up developments in terms of new technologies and new business models. So after uh, uh, a, re a recovery from the pandemic, um, given how um, activity starved consumers are in terms of, you know, you haven't flown for almost uh, a year. Um, there has been, have been populations who have not gone to a shopping mall for, for months or a year. Um, could this um, influx of new technologies and new business models bring us a um, global roaring 20s in which uh, really these activity starved consumers can come out of the gates and feast on new products, new services, and new innovations. Um, so that's one scenario. A second scenario, um, it, it, it's uh, around, uh, also around technology in terms of um, how technology breakthroughs can be amplified by more intense geopolitical competition. And arguably the pandemic has escalated um, an existing geopolitical competition um, to new heights. And you know, the private sector is really great at um, potentially commercializing new technologies. But in terms of groundbreaking scientific breakthroughs, some of those would take a national efforts. And given the ongoing um, competition uh, between certain powerful nation states um, that has been step sped up by the pandemic, um, can there be more uh, scientific and technological advancements with um, government backing under pressure that eventually would um, create amazing benefits to the private sector and for the rest of the world. The third scenario um, around um, finance, uh, arguably, uh, you know, you know, in terms of the, the, the monetary measures that have been implemented by certain countries uh, towards pandemic relief, in terms of you know, the, the, the creation of more money, um, that uh, also in a combination with uh, this whole idea of the power competition between nation states that has been escalated through the pandemic, um, will that to some extent continue the erosion of this whole legacy USD dominated fiat system that is also nation state centric? So on one hand, we are seeing this um, release of uh, CBDCs, you know, central bank um, digital currencies. Uh, in its nascent form as a way to potentially bypass the SWIFT system or uh, uh, as a way to really utilize blockchains for more transparency 
towards uh, transactions, uh, whether it's you know transactions along a Belt and Road or uh, transactions along uh, a different uh, di a different system, um, and, and and then on the non-nation uh, state uh, focused areas, uh, you know, again as investors are becoming uh, more and more aware of uh, this, at least the perceived uh, threat or this perceived. Um, uh, the perceived uh, notion of inflation and uh, money printing, uh, and as more investors look into alternatives in terms of scarce assets, such as Bitcoin, um, can there be a rising, budding, new parallel so-called crypto capital system that emerges, flourishes, challenges, and become challenged? It's not going to be a, a, you know, rosy, this is just going to be uh, uh, one escalation, but it may be a just a back and forth between the existing legacy monetary systems versus um, more parallel monetary systems, whether it's through CBDCs or through this entire decentralized crypto. Uh, I think in Miami last week there was this um, Bitcoin crypto uh, frenzy conference where the whole all the crypto world has gathered over there. But the, this whole idea of a parallel system monetary, even societal system that is taking shape and taking root and arguably being accelerated because of the pandemic. Wow. Okay. So three, three scenarios, roaring twenties, um, government backed technological breakthroughs and, um, cryptocurrency alternative societies or so to, to, okay. So let's, 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 let's have a discussion on that. But before we do that, um, um, now, normally we would ask Toshi, but then Toshi would always be in the middle. So let's move to Irina to, to move these <laughs> things around. <Irina. laughs> okay. Good. Jim gave us very uh, interesting overview. And uh, at some point it um, connects with what I'm going to say as well. Uh, uh, I would to stress uh, special <clears throat> attention uh, on the issue that the current pandemic uh, with its difficult and uh, prolonged recovery from disease, coupled with the limited travel activities and the appearance of free time uh, staying home, have revealed a huge need to understand ourselves, how we function, function. as a biological individual and how we can become gradually our own doctor. And uh, I actually uh, would like to offer uh, one uh, paradigm, one, one big scenario. And the main actor in all the scenarios became a person in contrary to the current state of affairs when uh, we can see in institutions, uh, products or services. And this is a major shift, I would like to say. And uh, it means that different uh, human needs appear in the focus. How to organize working process, how to build social network, to entertain ourselves, to relax, etc. And uh, those countries, industries, enterprises, individuals who can propose a better solution to a person with capital letter, <laughs> will win and uh, become leaders. And it's, it's about everything. It's about economics, it's about politics, it's about science, culture, actually all the, all the spheres, all the areas of our life. So this is my point. Well, and, 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 and we've all noticed that this goes, we, we talked about homo sapiens before, um, so the, the world, and, and now Irina pushes us towards, 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 towards a focus on the person. She doesn't say the individual, mm. on the person, the biological um, holistic being and what that means for, okay. Toshi, now, now, now we're excited to hear what you're saying. Um, wow, uh, this is tough uh, because uh, Jim and Aria both uh, hit a very important points. Well, I really liked 
Arena mentioned that uh, person-centric idea. So all the technology and whatever um, uh, uh, measures of the future development uh, should be centered on, on, on person. I agree, and, and that's my idea, my uh, ideal stage state uh, as well. But the uh, problem uh, is on the coordination, and, and also uh, people. Uh, coming from different background, different history, different culture, uh, what's good for them can be perceived in different ways. So uh, that diversity has been uh, since the uh, the internet has uh, come to connect everywhere. Uh, the cultural diversity uh, has been uh diminishing uh very rapidly and uh be it good or bad uh, of course as there's pros and cons and who cares about that the most i, I think these uh the uh the the uh sovereign governments uh who's supposed to serve the needs of the people within each sovereign state and uh, there are various styles. Uh, we, we, I, I mentioned. Um, I, I, I do not want to get into politics, but at least uh, in terms of the KPIs in businesses, uh, uh, one, some country uh, outstands <laughs> A plus. Uh, maybe Japan D minus, uh, but um, uh, there is a, a very. Uh, distinctive uh, uh, difference uh, in the uh, in in terms of the outcome, which is measurable, and then uh, we come to think. Uh, well, people only talk about the technology, but the technology has to be interpreted from two levels. One is genuine science, uh, but the other one is uh, more like the business model. I I I I think Philip is coming from Amazon, but uh, I I think the idea of Amazon has been known since 1980s. Everybody who has the the, the who understand the data and the network knew, uh, depending on the infrastructure, it can be done. Uh, people who has been doing that uh, uh, has made the great success. Not everyone can do that, but the idea was there for many years uh, and but the uh, in the western world uh, these technologies and the idea and the implementations are in the power of individuals and corporations which has become much more influential than the government uh, well the china there was a model of alibaba but it has it seems to be becoming the uh uh i i i, I don't know whether there's an argument or whether the <laughs> patent uh a vaccine patent should be protected or not or the alibaba model should be protected as a uh, independent corporation or not it, it could be shared or i don't know what the idea of Chinese government is. But um, the, uh, if people can coordinate, uh, the government can coordinate, and, and if the distribution of the contribution uh, can, can, can be made in a fair manner, uh, there should be a better coordination in the world. But uh, unfortunately, the rivalry uh, between private companies or the, uh, between nations or uh, between different levels, rich and poor, uh, these are really <clears throat> uh, ma ma making the actual condition very, very difficult. But one thing we know is, and what I fear the most is, I'm always skeptical towards the bureaucracy. And uh, as I worked with the World Bank, I know what World Bank is. And uh, the global government is in definite need for money. They have spent too much. They borrow too much. They need money. And that money has to come from somewhere. Uh, it's not from income tax. Uh, it, it should be charged on the capital gain. Uh, look into the uh, change of the GDP and the change in the stock price. So the government uh, is coming after uh, all these capital gains in the future. And uh, also uh, it will become the <coughs> conflict across the 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 the, the, the moment, uh, who want to charge big fines on Google. <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, I, I'm quite pessimistic, but uh, I, I hope uh, there will be the uh, uh, global wisdom uh, which will make everybody understand how stupid it is to 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 actually 
uh, fight against each other. Uh, and, and finally, one, one thing is sometimes uh, countries or the neighbors being a little bit far away is better than being too close. <laughs> uh, in Japan, we say the the fight among the relatives is more nasty than the fight against the business rivals. Okay. Interesting. So what we've worked out, we started with the scenarios and what we've worked out that in the uh, coming out of the pandemic, we are... Um, we are having to address these very tough questions, which are human questions and who've been human questions probably forever um, 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 in, in terms of what's the relationship between the collective and the individual. Um, how, do we, how, how do we address shifts in, in the focus on what's at the, at the heart of what we want to look at? Because of course we can do either. And then we've had both, um, all three of you actually, look at mechanisms that that might balance this out. Um, think Jim's a crypto optimist or realist or so, and who sees neg also negative aspects in all types of um, um, smart contracts, etc. Whatever comes out of that, um, and um, and Toshi, I think, has really also brought us back to to um, the fear or, or the, the the balances that we need to we need to address as in um, even even like be, let's if we become too close as a human a planetary family um, we'll have like interesting nasty nasty things to deal with um, we have three more minutes so that gives each of you at least 30 seconds to give policy advice to all our leaders who are joining this conference and who will watch this YouTube video forever and ever in the future. Um, what is your advice to leaders as we're coming out of the pandemic? And obviously we know this time, Toshi is first, Irina is second. No, Jim second, Irina is last. <laughs> So then we have it all in under control. Toshi, the floor is yours. Be fast. Okay. Uh, love your neighbor. <laughs> that was super fast. Wow. <laughs> love your neighbor. Good. Um, handing over to Jim, right? Yeah. Uh, I think uh, one advice would be uh, education innovation to center around how to tackle ambiguities because no one has a crystal ball. Uh, what's going to happen. So uh, being able to tackle ambiguity is a is paramount for the future. How do we tackle ambiguity? Uh, being able to uh, really have uh, frameworks and mental frameworks to adapt and be agile as opposed to focusing education on just knowledge and skill sets. Okay, great. That's a great advice. Um, and Irina? Yes, education is the first thing uh, towards all to including all the disciplines for understand the process taking place in the human body and the human psyche. It's basic. We need it so urgently. Uh, it should be practical knowledge. We have to use it. Uh, it should be significant shift in the medical surface from treating the illness towards. Uh, building one's health consciously and uh, the third one is uh, government businesses and NGO have to bring individual needs of the citizens ahead of the political national and regional ambitions wow. and if, if i have uh, another another 30 seconds i can give you a small example in uh, 1950s um, in Japan, a real tragedy unfolded. Thousands of cases of poliomyelitis were registered in the country. And a life vaccine produced in the USSR could stop the epidemic. But for the Japanese government, registration of and authorization to import drugs from the Soviet Union was an unthinkable precedent. Uh, then the mothers of the children with polymelitis went to the streets demanding permission to import the Soviet vaccine. Mm -hmm. And they achieved their goal. The urgent import of vaccine was organized and 
20 million of Japanese children have been rescued from the threat of this disease. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Doesn't it remind you something that nowadays? I mean, exactly the same. Wrapping up, love your neighbor, have mental models or reflect your mental models that allow you to deal with um, ambiguity and work cross-disciplinarily, Irina. That's what I take out of what mm -hmm. you've said and focus on the individual, like the rights of the individuals over the rights of the collective. Mm. Wow. And we did all that in 40 minutes. Thank you <laughs> very, very, very much. This was amazing.